So I'm excited to introduce our special guest this week. John Avalos is a candidate to rejoin the San Francisco Board of Supervisors representing District 11. He is a lot of things. He was the former chair of our budget and finance committee, which gives John a particular uh, set of keys to the proverbial castle. Uh, his district includes a number of neighborhoods, Crocker Amazon, the Excelsior, Ingleside, Ocean View, and the Outer Mission. And his first term on the Board of Supervisors many years ago started in 2008. And uh, he was uh, he left office in, in 2017, and we're very excited to help him get back into City Hall. Welcome to uh, to our live stream, John. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you. It's uh, really great to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, excited to share uh, the happenings in District 11 uh, under the COVID-19 spell we're all under right now. Yes, and we'll, we'll get to that in just a minute. One thing I want to really highlight for people is just your long history of public service. And one of the particular legacies that I think about when I think about your term, the last time that we had a chance to be represented by you on the board, was your work around securing the sanctuary city commitment uh, back in 2011. Could you share a little bit with people just about that history, what that looked like? You know, I think of that as a profound act of leadership that you, you've given to the city. And, and to the extent you see that commitment at all under threat today, you know, whether by Trump or other actors, we'd, we'd love to learn a little bit about that. Well, um, yeah, thank you for that the question. It's actually one of the things I think it's most significant about my time on the board. Uh, it was actually, um, you know, work that I had been doing for many, many years, going back to my work in labor that I was involved in immigrant rights work, actually going back to, you know, uh, 1994, when uh, Proposition 184 was being uh, put forward or to uh, deny immigrants living in California any type of access to healthcare and education benefits. Uh, that actually, that measure, I think it was Prop 187, had actually passed, uh, but it was actually thrown out by the courts as being unconstitutional to, to deny people uh, basic rights based on their status. So, um, but so that was my earliest involvement with immigrant rights, uh, and then in uh, 2006, uh, when uh, Sensenbrenner, Congress. Member Sensenbrenner was putting forward some really awful legislation, very similar to what was being done had been tried in California with Prop 187. Uh, they tried to deny all these rights and ability for people living uh, as immigrants in the United States to have any access to the same type of services and care. Um, in in San, there was just movements all over the country to uh, protest this legislation and to work against it. In San Francisco, we had demonstrations that were involving like 30,000 people on the streets, some of the biggest immigrant rights uh, demonstrations that we had ever had. Um, and we realized that there was a lot of fear that was sown, sown into the community. Uh, and uh, members of the community who were immigrants uh, and their allies, we needed to have information about what was happening. There was so much hysteria that was whipped up. Uh, and people didn't know what was uh, up or down, right from wrong, in terms of uh, policies affecting immigrants. So in San Francisco that year, uh, we put a million dollars in the budget uh, to create the San Francisco Immigration Legal and Education Network uh, that would provide uh, legal assistance for folks who were you know, seeking support as they were being um, rounded up in the immigration system uh, or uh, to be able to just avail themselves of services that can help get themselves on a pathway towards citizenship. Uh, and so that, is, that was established, that was part of my record in, in you know, making sure the immigrants had resources here in San Francisco. Um, then in, um, you know, in, it was 2013 that I, we actually worked to update uh, the sanctuary policy, and we did it again in 2016 as well. Uh, in uh, 2013, we had many, many years of the secure, the quote unquote, secure communities program that was basically using uh, local uh, courts and law enforcement uh, to uh, receive information about who in the system was uh, undocumented, who wasn't. Uh, and then basically the the federal government, ICE, was requiring uh, the courts and the sheriff's departments around the country uh, to provide them the release dates of people who were uh, leaving the system so that ICE could be there to pick them up or take them over. And so basically we uh, built a coalition of uh, grassroots activists, a lot of organizations representing the immigrant legal uh, immigrant community, 
a lot of, a lot of lawyers, uh, members of the SF Island Community Network, um, Garesen, uh, groups under the coalition called Free SF, uh, had worked with my office to develop a, a new policy uh, that would basically bar um, the city and county from turning over any information to ICE about people's release dates from, uh, from, uh, from the jail system or from the court system. Um, and essentially we wanted to do this because uh, when people who are immigrants uh, talk to law enforcement and believe that their involvement with law enforcement, whether it's as victims of crime or witnesses of crime or actual perpetrators of crime, uh, their cooperation with law enforcement actually is, is greatly inhibited when they think that uh, they're discussing anything with law enforcement is going to lead to their uh, potential deportation. Uh, and so we wanted to make sure that uh, as we're trying to make uh, public safety work for everyone, uh, that those who are actually living in San Francisco uh, can be assured that uh, they could actually seek remediation through the, through the justice system uh, and restoration of any harm caused in the justice system without any fear of, of being uh, deported. Uh, and that was the premise behind the legislation. Um, and we actually were able to get that legislation passed unanimously in, I believe it was September of 2013. Um, and it was probably the strongest legislation in the country uh, that would separate local law enforcement from the immigration uh, dragnet that was uh, stepped up under the Obama-Biden administration. Um, so that was, you know, the original part of it in 2013. Um, but we actually Thank had so update that update again in 2016 later. as well. But I'll stop right there. No, I, I, I do want you to go on. I was just saying thank you for doing that work. It's such a profound contribution to the community. And as an immigrant, I feel, you know, while not in a direct beneficiary, I, I feel, you know, just very grateful for your leadership there. And, and then, you know, you mentioned the uh, unfortunate bipartisan nature of the assault on immigrant rights over the last decade. Is there anything you want to say about the state of immigrant rights today? You know, Trump, for instance, recently declared a ban on immigration entirely. And yeah, until the I mean, pandemic just, hit, you know, ICE was declaring a crackdown on sanctuary cities, including specifically SF. You know, I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. Yeah, it, it, it appears that Donald Trump is just basically a one-trick pony. Um, you know, is trying to assert this America first and narrowing down what America first uh, means. Uh, pretty much it means like uh, a white America uh, and not America that really understands and, and accepts and embraces the incredible uh, commitment uh, that we have to uh, people who come from all over all, all over the world to, to be here, whether they're forced migration that happened with, you know, Africans and African Americans who have come here, um, or other people from all over the world. Um, and we need to balance that, of course, with indigenous people who actually have, uh, you know, go back tens of thousands of years of being here in, in, in the Americas. Uh, but yeah, that's the, that's the world we live in. Uh, and anytime there's like any kind of incident, um, that stokes up uh, people's feelings about immigrants um, that's actually exploited by, by Donald Trump and even like the Democrats when it comes to, um, you know, how we uh, make sure that we're protecting everyone who lives in our, in our, within our borders. Um, in 2015, there was, uh, in San Francisco, we had the incident where there was an accidental shooting of Kate Steinle. Uh, by an immigrant. Uh, this happened maybe about a couple of weeks after Donald Trump had first announced that he was going to run for uh, run for president. Uh, and of course, we all know his announcement was singling out immigrants from mostly his idea of Mexico, although it's probably from all over the world or Latin America, as uh, as rapists and criminals. Uh, it might and, be the one area where his equal opportunity is his hate towards so many people who are differently situated, but I digress. Yeah. Yeah. It could very, could very well, could very, very well be. So basically he used the image of Kate Steinle as, um, as you know, the, what was at stake by allowing immigrants to remain in our country. Um, and here in San Francisco, both Democrats and Republicans uh, alike were saying that our sanctuary policy was too strong. Um, Dianne Feinstein, who um, was a uh, senator, is still continues to be senator. She may have been running for Senate uh, around that time, uh, had uh, basically said, I'm going to go into the jails and like see you know, how our justice system is working, and I want to make sure our jails are able to work with ICE. So she went down to Los Angeles County to do, to do that work. Um, and then here locally, um, 
And we had, we had an update to our sanctuary policy back in 1994 uh, that basically said if you were merely booked on a felony, uh, that you could be turned over to ICE. It was never enacted, and people forgot about it over the years. Uh, but when after the Kate Steinle incident happened, uh, you know, the politics that were driving, you know, our local politics here in San Francisco, and the sheriff, McCarimi at the time, was not in the good graces of Ed Lee, who had tried to oust him um, years before, uh, had basically said that, uh, look at the old piece of legislation that was never enacted and said, that was never uh, enforced and said, you know, uh, Ross Mercury should have picked up the phone and called ICE because this person was booked on a felony in the past. Uh, and uh, Ross Mercury didn't do that. And so the new sheriff coming in, who was that was an election year, the new sheriff who came in, basically, she ran on a policy that I'm going to be turning over people to ICE. I'm going to be making sure that we're not uh, putting a blockage on the ability to create a create make our streets safer by turning, you know, immigrant criminals over to the ICE, you know, program. Uh, and that was a complete, you know, turnaround from what, you know, we had originally, you know, uh, put our, why we put our immigrant rights legislation forward in the first place. Uh, and so we had to fight back, uh, not just on to uh, restore our sanctuary policy to exclude this language that would allow law enforcement to turn people over to ICE just for being booked on a felony. Um, we had to actually convince the sheriff that her, her, her approach was going to be wrong. And so we had to go back and re re revise the whole sanctuary policy uh, in the past, uh, from, the, from, the, from scratch. And that's what we did in 2016. When we did that in 2016, involving all the same groups that we had done before, uh, this time we had Breitbart News in the board chamber. And Breitbart News was there training their cameras on Ooh. immigrants, okay. uh, trying to show that uh, immigrants uh, were causing, you know, great fear and harm, even within the board chamber of the room and trying to show these lurid scenes of just regular people, yes. <laughs> uh, you know, in, in, in the uh, board chamber. Uh, and, um, you know, I think the presence of Breitbart and the attention that was given helped to convince the sheriff to actually lessen up her attitude about, you right. know, she didn't want to be associated with the right wing elements right. in this, this right. country. Right. Um, and so we were able to eventually, you know, convince her to drop her, her, her mode of, you know, trying to enforce uh, the federal law at the local level and allow local law to prevail uh, to make sure that we can actually protect our immigrants moving forward. In the process, um, after 2015, after this Kate Steinle, uh, you know, kill, accidental killing, um, Fox News was in San Francisco uh, trying to whip up a lot of hatred for San Francisco for having a sanctuary policy. There were people knocking at all the supervisors' doors who had, um, who had voted in favor of this legislation, which means all of us at the time. I had just moved, and so they went to my old house. Uh, and a week after Fox News went came to my, went to my house, okay. um, my, uh, the, the cars in front of the old house I lived in uh, were torched. Uh, so, you know, there was a lot at stake for people to take a stand on uh, immigrant rights and a lot of the hate that had been whipped up uh, was actually making it uh, very difficult for uh, people to feel they can make decisions, or elected officials to feel that we can make decisions without retaliation being made against us. That's pretty much the saga of the immigrant rights sanctuary city uh, update that we've had. When it comes to, um, you know, uh, fight against the Trump administrations and the stepped up attacks on immigrants, uh, the sanctuary policy that was written in 2016 uh, was actually defended in the Supreme Court of the United States by the city attorney. So uh, the language that we had put together with uh, immigrant rights activists and the Im immigrant community that was embedded in that legislation was actually uh, spoken forth and defended uh, at the uh, Supreme Court of the United States. So that's just so incredible work. I mean, all of it, the vision, the execution, the persistence of it over time, the relevance of it over time, which has grown only more poignant since. The, the story you shared, I knew some top lines of that, but the story you shared about the cars outside your old house, I had never heard that before. I'm so uh, just grateful to you for you know taking that risk on yourself. And it's, again, a really profound act of leadership. And I, if only to have a voice back on the board that has done that important and hard work of standing with immigrant communities at a time when it's still, you know, we are all vulnerable. It's just, a, thank you for doing that. If, if that was an example of your visionary work in the past, I want to turn the lens forward to your agenda in terms of returning to the board now in your candidacy. And I know that you've been an uh, outspoken advocate and a really critical one 
as the chair of the Budget and Finance Committee of Public Banking. Do you want to share with our audience a little bit about why public banking can be so crucial to support everything from climate justice to worker rights? Uh, yeah, great. Um, I've been working on uh, public banking in, since about uh, 2011, uh, the year I ran for mayor in San Francisco. Uh, that was one of my signature pieces, uh, was um, making sure that we could actually have control of our own uh, tax dollars and our own expenditures. Right now, uh, back then and still to this day, uh, the city and county of San Francisco does its banking, uh, its cash management with uh, major banks like Bank of America. At that time, it was Wells Fargo. We might be using U.S. Bank now. And so basically, we give away all of our uh, money to these banks to manage, and we uh, actually have to pay a fee for that. Um, and there's no reason why we can't be in control of uh, our own banking uh, ourselves. If, if the money is ours, uh, why give it away to uh, another financial institution? Uh, and also the, the immediacy of that, the importance of that is that we know that uh, the banks, uh, despite uh, being bailed out with our public dollars, they still think for their shareholders and not the public at large. Uh, and uh, so we'll see that there's so many uh, uh, problems that they have and scandals that they've, in, that they've uh, shown us uh, about how they mismanage our dollars, how they, uh, they uh, go after our, uh, our property. Um, they prevent us from, they actually make, you know, like, like Wells Fargo was making false accounts for people without their permission. Uh, but at that time in 2011, um, San Francisco had experienced uh, the subprime loan crisis and the Great Recession that was caused by the banks uh, uh, failing. Uh, a lot of it was based on speculation on mortgages. And in this city, in San Francisco, there was uh, this uh, <clears throat> complete uh, turning a blind eye by the political establishment and City Hall to uh, the thousands of people in the southern part of San Francisco in the Excelsior District 11, uh, Visitation Valley, Bayview, Hunters Point, Lakeview neighborhoods. So looking at District 10 and District 11, all these households, mostly uh, working class, people of color who had worked for years to be able to own their own property uh, with mortgages uh, and to see a lot of them actually go into default and eventual foreclosure. And so the public bank idea came out of the process, out of the idea like we can't, you know, leave the fate of working people living in the southern part of San Francisco and District 11, District 10 uh, to the private banks. Our city has a responsibility to actually make sure that uh, we can have more secure uh, mortgages, uh, that we can actually uh, use our city dollars to actually do principal reduction, uh, to re-modify loans, to make sure that we can actually have uh, interest rates that are actually going to work for working people, um, that are actually uh, going to make you know owning a home recession proof. Uh, those are the ideas behind you know wanting to create a public bank, uh, and we also saw you know around that time in 2008, all these banks received you know 800 billion maybe uh, almost right. close to a trillion dollars in bailout money. Right. Uh, that bailout money uh, went to Wall Street banks and didn't go to Main Street. Uh, and so really we wanted to see how we can actually take back, you know, using our local city funds to uh, really shore up Main Street, small businesses, uh, local property owners, local uh, working class folks, so that uh, our fate and our financial fate can be in our own hands, used for our own purposes for community development. So powerful. I mean, between seeing the aspects of your vision that have been able to take root in policy, like with the sanctuary commitments, and then the parts of your vision that have yet to be secured in policy, but, and maybe just, you know, to set the historical stage for people, I, I think a lot of our listeners might you know, come to politics perhaps in the last few years, maybe the last four. And I think there's been a really dramatic mobilization among people on the left since the emergence of our criminal president, Trump, right? Uh, but, you know, in 2008, 2011, this vision that you're articulating of you know, refashioning the banking system and creating alternatives that put public externalities before private profit and, and privilege keeping people in their homes over the sort of corporate predation that it characterizes private banking, it's just such an incredible act of prescience. Um, and, and I do hope very much to see that aspect of your vision also take root. Again, sorry for the background noise. I'm not exactly sure what's <laughs> going on. Well, but, well you know, um, you know, these ideas have been kind of swirling around for for a while. Um, I believe Matt Gonzalez uh, talked about the public bank when he was uh, running for mayor. 
Um, he didn't remain in office, you know, after he, you know, didn't win. Uh, and so that kind of like was just sitting on the outside, just not being worked on. And so I, I, I picked it up. And at that time in 2011, there was uh, uh, the Occupy movement that had started. Um, and here in San Francisco, it, it was much greater than people occupying public space or just looking at uh, the Federal Reserve Bank on Market Street or uh, Justin Herbert Plaza after they were ousted from the Federal Reserve Bank on Market Street. Right. People were occupying homes here. People, there was a whole street on uh, in, in uh, District 10, Quesada Street, where there were maybe about five or six homes that uh, were all, you know, in default and going through foreclosure. And we were there, you know, uh, occupying homes, make sure that uh, the banks weren't going to take them over. And uh, we were, we've been around in District 11 and District 10 to stop the sheriff from evicting people from their homes because they're still within the process of trying to modify their loans and they're not getting support from the federal government. They're not getting support from, uh, from the local banks to be able to actually, you know, have a process where they can retain uh, their, their property. So yeah, this has been an ongoing issue, but real you know things happening on the ground uh, that show us that we need to make uh, our government resources much greater uh, to support working people and not just the, the the Wall Street banks and the one percent. Right on, but and, and when we think about other ways that those disparities between the ninety nine percent, you know, those of us who uh, you know are, are working people and the one percent, uh, you know, the wealthy people who survive on the and, and profit very. Uh, and live lavishly off the labor of others. I see one of the events in that's under folding under our feet that's really sharpening those distinctions and deepening that divide is obviously a pandemic. And you know we're seeing this bifurcation between, on the one hand, folks who have the privilege to work from home uh, and 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 com be compensated without putting themselves at risk, and so many Americans for whom putting food on the table means accepting health risks. Can you talk a little bit about how the pandemic's impacting your constituents in D11 and thinking particularly about, uh, you know, your work as a, a, a labor union organizer in the National Union of Healthcare Workers? Do you want to talk anything, either, maybe both, your constituents in D11 and the healthcare workers that we're all relying on to keep us, keep us safe in this time of pandemic? Um, yeah, sure. Lo I'd love to. I, I think, um, you know, everyone's world is turned upside down right now. Um, whether you're able to work uh, and shelter in place, um, you know, your, your home is not the most ideal place to, you know, be able to, you know, do your work. Uh, and it's also now if you have, if you have kids who are in, in school, uh, they're at home and they have homework and they're, they have work they're doing. And so you're actually really, um, you know, uh, struggling to like how you can accomplish all the things you need to accomplish in in your home. In sa in this part of San Francisco, we're mostly uh, working class, uh, middle class folks. Uh, there are not a lot of independently wealthy people, so everyone here is working um, uh, to to get by, and a lot of working in the service industry, and a lot are essential workers. So people who are in the grocery stores, people who are making sure our supply lines are are open. Uh, and so you have a lot of people who are actually working here who are exposed uh, to um, community spread and are also working really hard to stop, you know, community spread and are doing their part in not in their homes, but in their workplaces. So you have this combination of people who uh, are, are working and putting themselves at risk. Uh, and then they come home to their families and um, they, perhaps they're putting their families at risk. It's always hard to like stop, you know, the, the transmission or, or just be free of the worry about transmission. So it's an anxiety that we all have. And then we have a lot of workers who uh, work in the hospitality industry in this part of town. A lot of hotel uh, union workers, um, a lot of people work in restaurants, a lot of immigrants who work uh, in the kitchens, um, a lot of servers, uh, a lot of, they're all out of work. And so that's a huge issue. You go to our, our parks and earlier in the part of the pandemic before uh, the parks were, when the parks were kind of open, you saw a lot of our restaurant workers out there um, playing soccer or being out uh, with friends, hanging out because they didn't really have a lot of space in their homes to hang out in. Uh, and that's now, now that's closed down. But so many people have been, you know, lost their jobs. Here in this part of San Francisco, um, 
we were over 50% foreign born. Um, not everyone's undocumented. A lot of people, you know, probably the majority have green cards, but we probably have a lot of people who are undocumented. Um, and so right now, if you're undocumented, you are, don't, you can't access unemployment. You can't access any of the relief funds. Um, to, his, to his credit, Gavin Newsom has set up a relief fund for immigrants undocumented immigrants in California, and I think that's exactly the right thing to do, but you can't do it for the, from the federal government. So we have a lot of folks who are just, you know, living with great anxiety about unability to find, you know, even stimulus uh, checks to be able to keep, keep, keep going. Um, and, you know, our efforts to actually um, prevent people from um, being evicted for not being able to pay rent, are great that they're happening, but they're not as comprehensive as they need to be. They don't have the backing of the of the state government, uh, so we know still a lot of work to do to actually uh, bring some sense of economic security to a lot of people. Uh, in San, in this part of San Francisco, in District 11, we have a lot of households that um, have in laws. Um, that the only way you can actually afford to, you know be able to pay, keep up with your mortgage is that you have a room that you rent out. Often it's to a family member or it's to a relative or a friend of the family, very informal relationships that be, landlords have with tenants. Uh, but now you have uh, tenants who don't have the ability to pay their mortgages or their rents. Uh, and that means the landlord doesn't have the ability to pay the mortgage. So you have like uh, landlords, uh, property owners who are just working class folks who are struggling now because of the economic downturn. Uh, that affects some of the you know people that live in their own their own homes. So overall, we're seeing you know a great insecurity here in, in District 11. Uh, I think it's it's um, it's probably a greater part of District 11 is experiencing um, the 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 downturn that we're all you know in sheltering places causing. Uh, other places in San Francisco. Um, how well, we have a, a greater you know sense of wealth like look at district six you probably have a lot of people who are billionaires living in district six mm -hmm. uh you also have probably the poorest people in the world who don't even have a place to live right. uh, and live on house on our streets uh but you you have it but district 11 is much more homogenous in in who lives here economically uh and you probably have a greater portion of people in district 11 they're experiencing a lot more anxiety about you know accessing uh the basics to you know keep up rent uh, keep food on the table, uh, keep their kids, you know, uh, going through the education system, trying to work from home uh, while all the stresses that you're going under, you know, with your family are, are around you. These are, this is the reality of a lot of working people, middle-class people here uh, in District 11. At the same time, um, this is a really vibrant part of San Francisco. We don't get a lot of attention from uh, the rest of the city. You don't see stories about, you know, District 11 in the Chronicle. Uh, but you have so many people who are very active and doing a lot of mutual aid work in this in this part of town. We're doing a lot of work around making sure that we get our fair share from uh, resources of, from the rest of the city, even though we still don't. It's the, it's the work and activism of a lot of people in District 11 that keep our commercial corridors uh, functioning at a better level, that keep our parks working, and make sure that we have a the kind of public safety needs from police and fire and community policing that we're supposed to have. Uh, all of these things are based on a lot of activism from district level residents who know that it's our voice that works collectively that makes city hall, you know, pay attention to us rather than the 1% that really dominate uh, this city. And thank you so much for giving voice to that community need for representation. You know, you're, uh, it hasn't been at least the seat on the board representing D11 has been uh, wielded very differently uh, by the person who's occupied it since you came in. Let's talk about your 2020 race. Tell us about uh, both what prompted you to get in this time around and then also how people can plug in to support your campaign. Uh, great, thank you. Um, well, let's see. Um, when I was in office, the key to power, the key to change at City Hall, especially from a neighborhood like District 11, is really based on the collective voice of people here on District 11 challenging the status quo at City Hall. Um, we, we helped to, at the time when we had the Great Recession, a lot of resources were being pulled out of uh, the neighborhood. And so we realized that uh, to challenge that, we need to build up our community leaders and assets. In District 11, typically, there's been like, you know, a group of like maybe 15 
folks who have an active voice in City Hall. They represent a lot of neighborhood associations who do good work in the city, uh, but they actually have not you know, been welcoming to a lot of other people who aren't part of their neighborhood association groups to be able to have a voice at City Hall. Uh, and what the neighborhood group, association groups, you know, focusing on the basic ideas of quality of life issues often leave out, you know, workers or immigrants or uh, people who are actively, you know, seeking better education, you know, uh, within the schools. Um, and, and so when I was in office, we actually developed a whole new voice of folks to work together with uh, the, the community, uh, the neighborhood association folks, and broaden what was really important to be in the quality of life for people in the city. Uh, we were able to like move forward uh, during my time in office on, you know, getting huge park improvements that we're now seeing come into, into place on uh, McLaren Park, is the most beautiful park. This is a picture of McLaren Park behind me. Uh, we have all kind, we have new roads and bike paths and walkways and, you know, par and playgrounds that are all a part of that because of the great, you know, activism and collective voice of people in District 11. Uh, we have two new affordable, 100% affordable housing sites that are being built uh, in District 11. We're still in the pipeline, but we were able to get them in the pipeline based on the new voices that came forward for District 11 residents. We were able to get community gardens and community farms here, after school programs, more bike lanes, just a whole level of infrastructure that really wasn't being focused on by neighborhood association groups. And uh, we were moving that forward really successful and, you know, because I was a progressive and the mayor was a moderate, uh, the mayor's office would really turn down the spigot on how quickly they were going to get projects, you know, done. And when I was in the district, so uh, a lot of the things that I was hoping to cut the red ribbons on when I was in office uh, didn't happen until the next person, until Asha Safai came into place. I gave him a list of all our projects, and these are the people that helped to work on them. Uh, and uh, basically, he just decide not to work with the folks that we brought to the table, that we brought to have a voice at City Hall and just work with the neighborhood association folks. And, um, you know, it was a big loss for a lot of people in the city and it really meant, or in District 11, it really meant that uh, the people in District 11 who had seen that they could actually, you know, tip the scales on, on who gets supported and how we can have a district that's served by, everyone in the district can be served by the city, uh, that they lost that ability, uh, wanted to make sure that they could have a challenger to uh, Asha Safai. I was interested in, in running, but I also wanted to make sure that a lot of the community folks that, you know, wanted to re reclaim that voice together uh, were interested in supporting me. And they were going through their process over multiple years to identify a candidate. Uh, and out of that process, we were interviewing you know, eventually, and uh, they decided to come and support my, my candidacy moving forward. So it was a group decision that was made. And it was a decision that was really made that the power of being able to make City Hall work is not an insider strategy. It's not like a City Hall representative just saying, I'm going to do everything for you, and you're going to owe me for it. It's basically, we need to like work together. And you're on the outside, we build your uh, we build, we build our power in the outside of City Hall, so the person on the inside can be a fulcrum to actually uh, make huge policy changes that can affect the outside at a better level. And it's that power that we have together, inside-outside power, joined join together that can actually make a difference. Uh, and that's what we want to reclaim back in, in District 11. We want to make sure that we have a, vo a vision for the district that's going to look at um, social housing, affordable housing, 100% affordable housing on all public land projects, and at least 50% uh, affordable housing, family housing on, on uh, private property developments. That should be the standard across the city. It should be the standard in District 11. The, the new supervisor has come in. He's actually been involved in real estate development for a number of years. Uh, and uh, that's where he probably gets a lot of his, his income from, is from real estate property. Uh, and has a lot of friends who are developers who helped to fund his campaign. If you look at his contributions to his campaign right now, I think he has over $200,000. A good portion of that comes from real estate, interests, and developers. Uh, and basically, he's monopolizing the land that's available for development here for his cronies uh, to be able to develop here in a way that's going to gentrify our neighborhood if you look forward to, to the future. If we were to continue on this pathway, we know that a lot of the working class, middle class people here would no longer be able to afford to live here. That the housing that would be built here would not be built uh, for us, uh, but for other, for, but for the, you know, 1% and wealthy people. Uh, and we would be only, we would only be an afterthought. Uh, working people uh, who seek affordable housing, whether it's uh, 
property ownership or renting, uh, we need to be the, the front, on the front of that and not an afterthought about how we de develop in the city. Uh, and it's that changing of how we, um, we develop and who the city works for that we need to enable to happen with new government resources, I, of which the public bank is going to be one of them. I love hearing your vision, and I particularly want to just distinguish and independently praise both the substance of it, immigrant rights, public banking, you know, climate justice, worker rights, affordable housing, and the method of it, like the, the how with you, I feel like is as inspiring as the what. And to hear about the way you're able to take support from community and activist organizations in D11 and project that into an agenda that shifted policy and created projects for the community. That's just, it's amazing. It's exactly the kind of leadership we need on the board. And I'm very uh, excited and honored to support your candidacy. Do you want to talk a little bit about uh, anything that people can do to support you? I know we can't do events, right? Because there's a pandemic happening, but what are the other ways that folks can show up to get involved in your campaign? Um, well, uh, my website is avalos2020.com. Uh, and, you know, always uh, I'm running against uh, an incumbent who is involved with the real estate industry and developers, uh, and he's well funded by them over to the tune of about $200,000 at least. Uh, and if people, uh, I'm not receiving any money from developers or real estate interests. Uh, and in, when I ran in 2008, I didn't take their money then. I didn't take money from lobbyists. And you're barred from taking money from lobbyists now. So, uh, you know, it's really everyday people, grassroots folks who are funding my campaign. And if people were able to make a contribution there, that would be uh, tremendous support. Uh, so avalos2020.com. Uh, uh, and it'll be our website that you could sign up to actually uh, volunteer for the campaign, uh, to get our updates on the campaign. Uh, right now, under shelter in place, uh, we do not have uh, any activities we're doing, uh, but we'll be doing. We'll be starting up some virtual phone banks uh, in the next couple of weeks uh, to reach out to residents to start identifying voters, uh, probably around mid-May, and get the campaign going in earnest. So, if people are able to go on our website and sign up as an interested as a volunteer uh, or be able to make a uh, financial commitment, however large or small, uh, that will be great. If people are San Francisco residents. Uh, which I hope um, your um, your contributions up to your first hundred fifty dollars that you contribute will be will be matched uh, six to one. So one hundred fifty dollars uh, of a contribution will actually bring in nine hundred dollars of public financing. Uh, that will help level the playing field for grassroots candidates like myself, uh, and so that'll be a tremendous way to way to help. Uh, this coming um, Friday. Um, is uh, we're doing a Facebook Live event uh, for May Day, for International Workers Day. We'll be talking about, uh, you know, about the conditions of workers here, especially immigrant workers in District 11. And we'll be hearing from uh, worker leaders uh, in the neighborhood and what their experiences are. And, and they'll be asking me what I intend to do to support them uh, if I get into office. Thank you so much for joining us tonight and for running and for the incredible representation you've offered uh, the southern part of the city and that I hope you'll have a chance to, to offer again. Uh, I will invite everybody who's watching us to join me in supporting John's campaign. Thanks again, John, for joining us. I look forward to uh, seeing more of you and, and doing whatever I can to help support you over the next several months. Uh, thank you for having me and best of luck in your, in your campaign. Thanks, brother. I appreciate thank it. Thank you.